Savior. You're my strength and you're the rock on which I stand. You give me life and the grace that's greater. When I humble myself beneath your mighty hand, you bring times of refreshing. You bring times of refreshing. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. When I'm weary from the fire, trying to do what's right. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. For the day will come when we'll all be gathered, and the sun will rise with healing in its wings. And all the years of pain won't seem to matter when our eyes behold our teacher and our King. You bring times of refreshing. You bring times of refreshing. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. When I'm weary from the fire, trying to do what's right. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. We come to you for healing and life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Blind up our wounds. Forgive us our sins. And free us to love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our gospel text today contains the parable of the farmer who had an abundant crop and in order to store that crop, tore down his barn and built a bigger barn. And we'll see what that means for us. The main announcement I have, I have two announcements. One is read your messenger. The second one is There will be a potluck following this uh, worship service, which I always anticipate with enthusiasm. Let's begin with our opening song. Much brighter living in your world. Say what you did for me. Give me something I want everyone to see. When we stumble and it all goes wrong, only you can make it right. So I say, oh, 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 oh. learning to be alive. Whoa, whoa, learning to be alive. So much brighter living in your world Save what you did for me Give me something I want everyone to see When we stumble and it all goes wrong Only you can make it right So I say, oh, 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 o
Almighty and merciful God, you established your church with the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with that sacred fire that we may ignite with a passion for your will. Inflame our hearts to do good works in the building of your church. Finally, burn down the walls that keep us from you. These things we ask in your name. Amen. We learned today from the farmer who built a bigger barn, tore down his old barns, built a bigger barn, is that his problem was idolatry. And we'll learn that our problem is idolatry, putting too many things before God. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. That, our, that God Almighty cares so much about us that for the sake of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, he forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
All right, I'd like to invite the children to come up. I decided to bring my cordless drill. Yeah, a cordless drill. Do you know how old this cordless drill is? I think it might be like a couple, like probably 10 years or like nine or eight. About 10 years old? How about about 50 years old? Did you know they had cordless drills back then? I bet you it's even 60 years old. This doesn't even need batteries. How about that? And this is the real treasure. All those bits. This used to belong to my father-in-law. And he had a shop that made patterns for foundries. So he'd sometimes make a... a a gigantic pulley that would be then cast into cast iron and that would be for an elevator or he'd make a gear about that big and it would be used in a tank and he'd make the gear out of wood and they'd make a form from that piece of wood and then pour metal, hot molten metal into it. Let me show you how this cordless drill works. Do you know why I'm showing you this? This is a possession of mine. Our gospel lesson talked about possessions that I cherish. Not because I use it that often. It is because it belonged to my father-in-law. And it represents to me all the hard years of work that he used this in. Let me show you how it works. Now I've got to turn it this way. It actually ratchets even. Goes in two directions. <laughs> Don't press so hard on it that you bend the bit. There we go. The bit is made out of steel. You went, uh oh, ratchets in the wrong direction. See how it makes a nice hole? Even though it's bent a little bit? And then, when you want to get it out, you put it in the other direction, take it out. Am I going to use a different one? Well, you know, if we, if we had all the time in the world, I'd use a different one and show you more. But I, we don't have the time. So I'm going to put that one away. Don't you think that's neat? All right, here's my other cordless drill, which I use more often. And you guys have probably seen one of these, haven't you? Yeah. I like the old way sometimes. Okay. When we have stuff, you know the things that I cherish the most? I, I use this more often, but I like this more. Because it not only represents tools, but it reminds me of my father-in-law. And those kinds of things are the most important. Did you know that of all the things in the world, there's hope. There's faith, and there's love. And did you know the only thing that lasts is love? So sh we should always be doing things that show love. 
Because then we're building for eternity. Okay? Love is the greatest. This represents love to me, my father-in-law, and some cherished memories about him. All right, let's pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for life. We thank you for all you've given us. We thank you that we can love. Help us to love more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What's in your barn? But God said to him, the farmer, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Not too much good news there, is there? Statistics have bore out the fact that for every one life there is, there's going to be a death. We're all going to die. That's the bad news, part of the bad news today. If God were speaking to the farmer who had the abandoned harvest, he'd also say these words to us. I've been generous to you. Have you used what I have given you well? What have you idolized? Have you been a good steward? Let me share with you a couple of things from my life. That's my barn. I built that in my yard last couple of years. It started out, when I say I built it, I had some help from some friends too. And we went down to Branson, where a guy was moving, and he decided he was going to sell his shed. It was 10 foot wide by 16 foot long. So we dismantled it and brought it into my yard. I had to do a little bit more fixing on it. And when we erected it, it all of a sudden became 24 feet long and I added an upstairs to it. I wasn't satisfied with that. Still needed play, room, I thought, to put my mower and a few other things. So I even extended it another eight feet, so it's 32 feet long. Don't I have a wonderful wife? In my barn, there's a table saw. Ron Fells, sitting right back there. It belonged to him. In fact, maybe it still belongs to Ron. <laughs> I was going over to Ron's house so often to use his saw that he finally said to me one day, Dan, why don't you just take that saw home with you? <laughs> he said, I don't use it. I go, Ron, maybe your kids want it. They won't use it. So he gave it to me. And I said, well, Ron, if you ever want it back, just say the word. So it's been first in my garage and now in my barn. And I use it quite a bit, at least as much as I did when Ron <laughs> had it. <laughs> so... The problem is, all of a sudden, it's been blowing circuit breakers. 
I can't, first it was only when I put a load on it, and then it started, every time I, um, I would turn it on, it would blow a circuit breaker. So, I brought the motor in to have it repaired. Wednesday, I, I picked up the motor, Wednesday morning. And the proprietor of, a tr of the shop, a kind Christian layman, he brings that motor out to me and he says, you know, that is one fine motor. He was making me feel guilty because I had been thinking all week long, maybe I should replace the saw. But he goes, no, that's one fine motor. You will never find a motor as fine as that motor. I took it completely apart and put it back together. And he said, if I would have replaced anything, I would have dam damaged this motor. It is that fine. And boy, I'm going, he's, he's cherishing my motor. He's... Uh, He's making me think of it as a great treasure. And then I said, well, what was the problem with it? It kept throwing the circuit breaker. He goes, the problem is not in the motor. So sure enough, I brought it home and it was the switch. The, the, saw, the motor has a switch on it and it plugs into another little switch box on the table saw itself. And there was a problem with that switch. I cleaned up that switch and now it's working just fine. So this man is telling me, oh, you don't ever want to replace that motor. That'll be $82, <laughs> which you expect. Well, Ron did exactly what he should do, right? Got a saw, I don't use it anymore. Let me give it to someone who will use it. And I hope I will be a good steward of that saw and keep being a good steward and use it and use it well. And Ron might come back to me someday and say, Dan, I'm here about my saw. Have you used it well? And I hope I can say, yes, Ron, I have. And then he'll say, you know, it doesn't really belong to you. <laughs> Which is true. It's true of anything we have. It doesn't really belong to us. We're just keeping it for a while. And that's why God asks of us to be good stewards of what we have. Brings us to our parable. Man has, uh, he's a farmer, and he must be a pretty good farmer. Had a bumper crop. I remember back in the 1980s when they had a bumper crop in Kansas. They were little, literally, they filled up the silos and the, the, the grain elevators, we should say, and they started spilling the grain out on the ground. They put up block perimeters around and spilling it out on the ground, and they laid tarps over it to keep the rain and the rats out. They had so much. The government was paying people not to harvest their wheat. This man's problem, was, though, was idolatry. What did he do with his possessions? He thought, and he did some self-talk, taught some psyche talk, some very soul talk. He talked to himself at the ground of his being. And he said, Soul, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And when he did that and had all of his grain safely stored away, he said, Soul, Self, psyche, ground of being, eat, drink, be merry. God had different plans, didn't he? 
Idolatry is valuing something more than you value God. Putting something before God. Finding comfort, hope, and security in something other than God. Martin Luther believed that every violation of the Ten Commandments, in fact, we could say every sin, is a violation of, this, of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Putting another god besides Almighty God in life. For instance, if I bear false witness, it means that I desire something so much that I'm going to set aside God and what God feels is right for me in the world and I'm going to lie so I can attain that. Any of those sins. We could say um, If I, if I steal, it means that I have set aside God in the hope that God will provide for me in life, the confidence that God will provide for me in life. I set aside all that. And I steal because I put something primary before God. So, in a sense, Every behavioral sin is a sin of idolatry. Some, uh, some preachers slash theologians have thought that they'd try to help us see, because we, we never think of idols anymore, putting a God before God. We, we don't, when, when you say that, we, people think of, Oh, some statue, some totem pole, something. Uh, so, Tim Keller, as, as well as Jack Kaufman, Dick Keyes, Jack Miller, um, even Darren Patrick, they all put chapters in books, if not re have written entire books, on four things that they consider idolatry. And I just put them out for you to think about because you might be struggling with some of these. One is the idol of comfort, which I think is the idol of uh, our farmer. Not merely comfort, but security. By the way, they, they say the emotion that triggers is boredom. The idol of approval. You want people's approval so much they say the emotion that triggers is cowardice. You're afraid to ever tell them the truth in love because you want their approval more than you want anything else. The idol of control, the emotion is worry. The idol of power, anger. I can't control it, so I get angry. When I can't control things, I get angry. Comfort and security was our farmer's problem. And it tends to be a big problem in all of our lives. Christians are not immune to it. Back in the mid-1950s, there was a... In Greene County, Kentucky, there was a discovery of oil. In fact, the oil was so shallow, you could drill down 100 to 150 feet and find oil. There was a church in Greene County, Kentucky, that had five acres of land, 17 oil wells. Even though they only received 8% of the proceeds from that oil, that was still a huge sum of money. So what do congregations do when they get a huge sum of money like that, let's have a congregational meeting and we'll figure out what to do with the money. So they did. They paid off the church debts. Uh, here, here's the three things they determined to do. One, pay off the church de debts immediately. Two, put a sizable sum of money into the bank. I guess that's all right. 
divide the remaining money plus, plus future money among the members. What? <laughs> They're acting as though it's their money, aren't they? And finally, three, for the time being, stop taking in new members. <laughs> Don't want to share with any more, right? What did they miss? They failed to see that it wasn't their money. It was God's money. Therefore, anything they do with that money is about God's mission among them and through them to the community and to the world. They should have been saying, let's see how we can use this money to further God's mission. And for that matter, even among us, any talk about possessions and money in the church that doesn't first speak about mission is wrong-centered. might even be idolatry to think it's our money. It's God's money, God's abundance, God's possessions. We're only stewards of it. So are there any answers for us? So far this is all bad news, isn't it? Are there any answers for us? Well, let me lay down the law. Give. Can you give? Studies have shown that those people that accumulate things and do not give are never satisfied and are never happy. So an antidote is to be one of God's generous people. Dear God, help us to be givers. Help us to be generous. Help us to share. In fact, if you don't give, and, you know, I'm not talking about um, the amount I'm talking is up between you and God, but you have to give something, somehow. And um, if you can't give to your church, which I believe is your God-given responsibility, if you can't give there, find some place to give. Give. Secondly, oh, by the way, there's three kicks and a dollar. Have you ever heard that saying? Three kicks and a dollar? First kick is earning it. Second kit, kick is having it. The third kick is giving it away. Three kicks and a dollar. Secondly, remember God's gift to us. We come to the communion rail today. Just think, Almighty God himself is coming to us in bread, in wine, wants to be with us, in us, and go wherever we go. God has given us a treasure, his very presence. And where God is present, there is no need. Where God is present, we have all the comfort and security we need. When God is present, we have all the hope we need. Come, receive Almighty God Himself. Amen.
from greed and attachment to worldly things. Grant that we may be rich toward you and share God's glory with the world. Lord, in your mercy, break down barriers between neighborhoods, peoples, and nations. We remember places that are suffering from racial discord, police killings, and police being killed. And we pray that you be with our troops serving to protect us wherever they may be. Sustain community leaders, legislators, volunteers, peacemakers, and all who seek the good of their communities. Lord, in your mercy, healing God, give energy and compassion to caregivers, comfort all in need of healing, especially Meredith Adams, Cindy Anderson, Leo Biella, Carolyn Callum, Larry Carlson, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Dean Crane, Lyle and Lucy Dolly, Sandy Drake, Jeff Dykeman, Mark Henson, Ellen Kamens, Tina Law, Ellen Lassant, Carol Lohmeyer, Chris Marquardt, Annabelle Moore, Carolyn Nyes, and Kathy Zinter. Are there any others? God of hope, we rejoice in the resurrection. We pray that you comfort those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire our congregation to live in the present moment, O oh God, and to trust in you. In committee meetings, classrooms, and all ministries, give us flexibility to follow where you lead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, 
We await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today we commune via intinction, so you will receive the bread, a wafer in your hand, hold on to it until the chalice comes by and dip or intinct it into the wine. Our Lord invites us, all are welcome, please come. You may be seated. This is a body, and this is a blood, broken and pulled out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in his love. This is a body, and this is a blood. I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted the sacrifice that set me free. Well, I hunger and thirst for your love. Come fill me today. This is a body. This is a blood. Broken and pulled out for all of us. We share is love. This is a body. This is a blood. I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted. The sacrifice that set me free. We hunger and thirst for your love, your righteousness. We long for your presence, dear Lord. Be with us again. This is the body. Broken and poured out for all of us. Then as communion, we share in His love. This is a body. This is a blood. This is a body. This is a blood. Broken and pulled out for all of us. Dinner's communion. We share. 
is a body. This is a blood. This is a body. This is a blood. This is a body. This is a blood. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious God, in this meal you have drawn us to your heart. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your love this day and evermore. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Serve the Lord.